This is Metro Week, our top story fighting for a better education system. We'll look at the emergence of parent groups trying to help shore up their school budgets. Then our journalists roundtable analyzes the week's news. Welcome to Metro Week, I'm Andrea Kelly. Arizonans will vote in May on a proposal to expand funding for Arizona schools. Leading up to it, groups advocating for public education have become more active. We'll take a look at this evolution in educational advocacy. First, what's on the ballot and why? Then, what's at stake? Arizona's plan to ask voters for funding from the State Land Trust comes by way of a lawsuit. And the lawsuit came because the state didn't follow another voter-approved plan. Here's the history. In 2000, Arizona voters decided that the legislature should increase funding for K-12 education by at least the rate of inflation each year. During the recession, lawmakers stopped inflation increases, citing lack of available revenue. In 2010, schools sued, claiming the law required inflation funding. In 2014, a judge ordered the state to pay schools more than $300 million, and the state Supreme Court upheld the order. The legislature and governor agreed to settle the lawsuit last year by using the State Land Trust Fund. The fund was created at statehood, and it provides funding for education through public land sales and leases. It currently pays out 2.5 percent a year. The upcoming election asks voters to approve a 6.9 percent payout to give schools an extra $3.5 billion in funding over 10 years. It includes triggers that would reduce school funding in the case of a recession or if education funding grows to more than 49 percent of the state budget. If voters approve, opponents say they will be agreeing to a plan that doesn't meet the inflation funding requirement. If they reject it, schools don't get funding. One of the new advocacy groups is the Vail Parent Network. It started in September, and its members are working to support the Vail School District. Volunteers Stacy Winstrig and Heather Morzinski join me in the studio to discuss the organization's goals. Ms. Morzinski, let's start with why the Vail Parent Network formed in the first place. The Vail Parent Network started with a small group of parents who realized that there were large cuts that would really, really affect the Vail School District in particular last year in the legislature. And we've realized very quickly that it not only affects us, but it affects the entire state. And through our learning process, we've learned about budget cuts going back from 2008 forward um, that have decimated our district schools. And we're losing teachers left and right because they can't get raises. There hasn't been a raise in the Vail School District four of the last six years for teachers. Ms. Winstrig, what are the goals of the group then? If those are the problems you've identified, what are the goals? We, we have um, some short-term goals right now that we've been actively working on. We've been going into each of the schools within our district trying to inform parents just how bad educational funding is in Arizona, and we're finding a lot of parents just really didn't know. And so once we get them engaged and informed of, of the cuts that have been taking place over the years, they, they really want to know how, how can they get involved and how can they help make some positive changes. And that's been really exciting for us to see that people are getting engaged in the political process. And we're not, we're not political experts, we're just parents. And so once we inform them, we show them how easy it is to contact your legislators, to make your voices heard, to, to get out and register and vote and, and make sure your vote is, is heard. Um, but our long-term goal and our primary focus is to get legislators in office this November and from here on out that are gonna put education first, that are gonna make our kids and our teachers a priority, that has not been happening. And so our, our overall big goal is to, to really make a change in the legislative, um, how things are, are being voted on up there and, and get people in there. And, and truly represent what the parents and the voters want as far as public education. They're not doing that. So how does this differ from say a PTA organization? Our organization tends to be a lot more political, um, but we're also focused on, we're also a broad nonpartisan organization. Um, PTAs tend to look at the smaller pictures, um, focusing on their own schools, um, which is fabulous and critically important. Um, our organization understands that we have a much broader issue in the state of Arizona, and we would like to make a large change so that it's a lot easier on those parent organizations. 
fundraising has become out of control everywhere. In elections, you mean? No, or in PTAs. I'm PTAs. Sorry, PTAs. Yes. sorry, sorry. PTAs for schools are raising money for school supplies, mm. for paper. I mean, we're all of that types of things. I believe Stacy just did a fundraiser to get a new track for yes. one of their schools. PTAs are fabulous. They, they supplement so much in schools, but they can only fundraise so much. And we're talking about large amounts of money that are needed to be put back into the schools to into the main budget into the main budget to for capital budgets for supplies for teacher pay is the top priority that we're looking at and our teachers are just not being paid what they're worth they can go in to any neighboring state and make more money they are leaving the profession because they can make more money in just about any other job than in teaching right now in arizona and that needs to change at one of our meetings there was a uh, woman that had just moved here from Massachusetts and she has a master's in chemistry and she was a chemistry teacher in Massachusetts and she moved here with her husband and her husband's job and she has three young kids and realizes that she can't actually afford to teach here and have her kids taken care of at the same time so she's not teaching and that's a problem across the state and that's a state level funding issue so how have, have you been able to measure your success or will that come maybe in the next November election when you see your progress then? Have, have there been steps along the way you I can I think measure? we've seen some small um, successes. One, just the, the num sheer number of parents that are, that are engaging and that are joining the Vail Parent Network that are getting involved. We've had some really positive um, feedback and, and success in those areas. We've also had some small successes with meeting with our legislators and um, also um, looking to our current candidates that are running next year and, and gauging where they're on it and education and helping get their message out and, and also letting parents know that we do have some good candidates coming forth, at least in our legislative district down in Vail. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do from here forward is move into some key districts, help them start parent groups like ours to engage parents, to, to get people to pay attention and let the legislators know that the parents are, parents are paying attention to what's going on and they don't like what they're seeing and that, that parents can make changes. So, you know, in education funding, the biggest thing on the horizon is the May election, which is about whether school districts get some more funding, funding they've been due since that key year you mentioned. Um, has the group taken a position on that vote? As a group, we have not taken a position. Um, we have, there's several, um, it's split right at the moment. Um, from a district perspective, um, most of the district schools um, and administration need this money. Um, they realize that if they don't have this money, it's very possible there's going to be layoffs. Um, we already can't find enough teachers, but without this, the chances of even being able to pay for the ones we have is in serious jeopardy. Um, but at the same time, those of us who have the ability to take a step back and not be deeply involved in the current day-to-day -day funding issues. Um, there's a long-term issues with this particular bill that could be detrimental to education in the long term. So there's definite questions. So because of that split, there's no position taken. Correct. Correct. Okay. Well, I want to thank you both for coming in today and explaining what your group is doing and why. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, a broader view of the role parents groups play and why there are more of them now than in recent years. Longtime education advocate Anne Eve Peterson joined me to share her perspective. Groups like the Vail Parent Network have kind of been cropping up in the last few years. Why are we seeing that trend now? Well, I think what's happening is that it's become very evident to parents that their children's schools are deeply, deeply underfunded and that they are seeing the effects of that in the quality of the education that their children are receiving. When you have a situation like we do in the state of Arizona where three billion dollars has been cut since 2007 from an education system that was already one of the worst funded in the state, in the United States, um, you see things like we're seeing in Arizona. The inability to retain or recruit good teachers. 
You see supersized classrooms, so classrooms with way too many children. You see the loss of important uh, educational programs uh, in schools. And so I think parents for a long time were told, you know, this is just the effect of the recession. Once the economy rebounds, uh, you know, this money will be put back into schools and your children will have these things back that have been taken away. And what they see now uh, at the legislative level and at the gubernatorial level is that there's actually absolutely no intention of reinvesting what was taken out of education uh, starting in 2007. So that recession thinking is continuing at the state level and parents and, and advocacy groups are starting to realize uh, we're out of the recession and the, but the funding isn't coming. Right, we are now in a situation where there's a $325 million state surplus. And you know, most people um, with any sense of logic would see that you know, there are resources there to reinvest into education, which is an investment that only keeps giving back because if you don't have a well-educated populace, you aren't able to recruit good employers to come here. I mean, you just sort of start on this downward spiral as a state if you divest in education and don't reinvest. Um, but in fact, in Arizona, unfortunately, what I think is becoming very evident to regular citizens and regular parents is that there's actually an ideology in place in the powers uh, that be, among the powers that be in the state uh, house, state legislature, that really doesn't believe in public education or in making the investment. So there are people uh, very ideologically driven, including Governor Ducey, including uh, members of the state legislature that don't believe in funding, quote unquote, they call them government schools. They have a different agenda and they are not going to put this money back. So why are parents um, taking on this role or, or just generally, they don't have to be parents, education advocates taking on the role? Was it formerly a school board role or superintendents? Why is it landing in their hands at this point? Well, I think the problem that, that they um, see occurring and what we saw occurring when we organized as parents is that a lot of times the traditional um, entities, the superintendents and their association, school board and their association, teachers and their association, um, they are well organized and they do have lobbyists at the state legislative level. But when they try to come together and you know, let's say organize a rally at the, at the state legislature, there's retribution, so there's payback for them. And you've seen that play out in uh, you know, changes in terms of what the teachers association is allowed or not allowed to do. And so parents, there's really no way to um, retaliate against parents. I mean, what are you gonna do? You know, ban PTA meetings at schools? That's not gonna happen. And so parents are somewhat immune from those types of attacks. And as a result, they, they can be very powerful. But what has yet to happen and what really needs to happen is these uh, sort of um, homegrown uh, groups that crop up need to be integrated on a statewide level. So each community does need to come together and do this themselves. But then everyone has to talk with one another and have um, a, a sort of unifying message that ca they can take to the state legislature. And it's very hard to do that with just volunteer-driven efforts. I think at some point, you need to have some type of infrastructure in place and staffing and everything can't just be reliant on the volunteer model because sustainability becomes an issue. Now, you, you know, we've talked about the budget being one of the reasons that created these groups, mm -hmm. but we've also not seen them being effective at getting that funding. Why is that? Well, there's some built-in problems um, with uh, funding, uh, the, well, how we access funding in Arizona. Number one, they're very powerful, uh, as I mentioned before, ideological groups that do not want to see the reinvestment um, occur in what they call government schools. They have more of a privatization agenda. Um, in addition to that, there's a very strong sort of push and pull in the business community where they continue to want corporate tax cut after corporate tax cut. And when you're doing that repeatedly, 
you know, education funding is the biggest piece of the pie. So if you're for corporate tax cuts, you are also in favor of education cuts. And then there's just a structural problem because in Arizona, because of a voter initiative, it takes a two-thirds majority to increase any revenue. So if you were to say you wanted to reinvest the $3 billion that had been removed from our children's schools, there would have to be a revenue increase to do that. But there's a supermajority requirement at the legislative level that makes the reality of putting that into place very, very difficult. That's why most funding increases for education have been achieved at the ballot box. And I want to ask how, as we move toward the May election on mm -hmm. education funding, how these education advocacy groups could be sort of pitted against each other. I mean, can we assume they're all going to be for uh, the ballot initiative or the, the ballot question that would um, put some state land money into schools? Can we assume they're all going to be against it because it goes against voters' original education funding will? Or are they going to be head to head on that? Well, I, I hope what doesn't happen is that, you know, I hope that the education community isn't you know, pitted against itself because clearly there's not a monolithic viewpoint about this. Um, you, and I think there's some very good arguments why um, this constitutional amendment is not a good idea, but you have the education sort of establishment, the groups I mentioned before, that are for it. I think you're going to see um, other education advocates not uh, in favor of it, and unfortunately that creates a wedge issue which I, I just hope doesn't you know, cause problems further down the line for the education community because that's the last thing that we need. Now our journalist roundtable. Joining me in the studio today, David Rupcalvis of Tucson Local Media, Dylan Smith of the Tucson Sentinel, and my colleague Vanessa Barchfield. Dylan, we're going to stick on the topic of education a little longer, and I wanted to ask you if groups like the Vail Parents Network, are they enough to sort of change the education funding decisions, the momentum that's happening at the legislature? I don't know that uh, community groups like that are enough. Certainly, I, I think it uh, helps amplify people's voices when it, when it comes to issues like this, no, really no matter whether it's education or, or anything else. But it really took a concerted effort by education groups, uh, parents, uh, and um, really the business community starting to jump up and down quite a bit for the past year to reverse course on this decision to uh, basically defund JTED. So are they enough? No, but do, can they, uh, you know, draw some attention to things that certainly they can do that and uh, help people I think in a, in a way uh, on a more local level understand a little bit more about what's going on and how it affects them specifically instead of it just being something abstract that's happening up in Phoenix. And we'll get back to JTED but I, I also want to touch base on when they mentioned that they're not making a recommendation on the May election. Do you think groups like that should be out there in a, in a role telling people yes vote up on it or no vote down on it? Well, I, I think it would certainly depend on what the people in that group decide to do. Certainly, grassroots organize, organize, organizations like this are really pretty much what, what is fundamental to democracy. People assembling and uh, airing their grievances with the government, letting them know what they think about things. So you know, wh whether they actually decide to weigh in on this specific issue and, and become that political about things or to try and be informative, then, you know, that's kind of up to them. Parents are obviously a, a natural sort of stakeholder for forming a group like this the, 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 in, that we're seeing in Vail. Um, are other stakeholders getting involved in orga and, and organizing similar groups? You mentioned the business community. Are they doing that, for example? Well, you know, the business community, they, they've got their own business groups, but I think just about every single one of them across the state weighed in on this issue that this, that, that, you know, that about school funding, that we need to have more of it. They're, they're really jumping in on that. You know, and the Tucson Metro Chamber came out in favor of the proposition. You know, they're saying vote yes on it. It's interesting, we interviewed Mike Varney for Inside Tucson Business in the last week, and one of the things he was asked was, are you expecting tax cuts from the legislature? And his answer, while he didn't say it exactly, but he strongly hinted that he would rather see the legislature keep taxes as they are and fund education and fix roads and things like that. So I think the business community, at least the Tucson Metro Chamber, is saying we'd rather see that money spent on giving us an educated workforce than on giving us lower taxes. And on the May election that is coming up, Dylan, it's kind of sandwiched between a high-profile presidential preference election and then later in the year the, the higher-profile 
congressional, legislative, statewide, and local elections. What's your prediction for turnout in that May education election? Well, we'll have to see just how much uh, attention gets paid to, I, I think the, the education uh, proposition has the potential to attract more attention. There is another uh, proposition in, in that election about the state pension fund, and I think we will uh, certainly see uh, you know state and local employees who are directly affected by that uh, showing up and uh, taking part in that election. So there's definitely going to be uh, a, a base that is a, a little bit different than the normal sort of base that you see. Whether um, you know, uh, teachers and parents show up en masse to uh, take part in this, or, or whether their vote gets split because there is, uh, you know, uh, so many people who disagree as to whether this is actually a good idea or not to uh, sort of uh, put this money in but take away from uh, the potential money in the future. You know, and it's not a mistake they put it in May, and you, I see it all the time, whether it's municipality, county, or statewide, they intentionally put these proposition type things on the ballot where they want low voter turnout because they're either hoping that the supporters will turn out in mass and pass it easily, or they're, you know, in some cases, they're hoping the opposition will turn out in mass and make it fail. And, you know, it's interesting because it's been in multiple states, multiple areas, city, county, statewide level. They always try to hide it instead of having it in the big general elections. Dylan, you mentioned JTED just a few mm -hmm. minutes ago. I want to come back to that, which, and the governor actually assigned the bill this week to restore that funding. Um, what was the final version? What, how did that money actually play out in the end? What is well, it's, it's, I think it's almost a full restoration. It's slightly less than the money that was going to be cut. It's uh, very different than uh, you know a, a year ago when Governor Ducey said, let's cut all of this funding. And then he had a proposal uh, to restore some of it over a period of several years and, and then cut it off. This is uh, putting a lot more money back into the JTED system. And uh, it was really interesting to see all of the politicians who had been in favor of cutting and voted for getting rid of all of this money competing to be the savior of it this year after so many people really uh, you know, uh, got their hackles up over this. And then, as you mentioned, Governor Ducey was originally, I mean, he proposed the cut. It was in, it was in And now budget. he signed the bill to, to restore that yes. money that he cut. So analyze the politics at play there. Well, I, I think um, it, it depends on how, you know, uh, how clever you want to say that politicians are. Did he set all this up so he could be the savior? Or did he just end up coming out on the losing end of a uh, political wave? Okay, and one more political topic. I'm going to stick with you for just a minute longer, and that is that the uh, voter registration deadline for our presidential preference election is fast upon us. Run down what people need to know. The deadline to register to vote in what most people call our presidential primary next month is Monday at midnight. And if you want to have uh, take, take part in this, you need to be a registered Democrat, Republican, or a Green Party member. Uh, those are the only parties that have candidates on the ballot, and you, and you can only cast a ballot in the party that you're registered with. So if you are an independent and you want to have a, you know, want to cast one of these ballots, register with a party. You can deregister later, but uh, you know, know that uh, you can't show up at the polls if you're an independent. It's not going to work. Monday is it. Yes. All right, so now we'll finally move away from that kind of politics, <laughs> but we're going to still talk about politics, David. Uh, in, um, the Northwest Explorer this month covered the relationship between Count Pima County Administrator Chuck Huckleberry and Pima County Supervisor Allie Miller. I'm not sure everybody has followed the ins and outs, everybody watching. Um, so first, just tell us about that relationship. It's very strained. You know, um, Supervisor Miller ran for office, and one of the things she was very public about is she wanted to get rid of Chuck Huckleberry. She doesn't have the votes to do it, but that hasn't stopped her from being true to exactly who she, she said she was. She has opposed pretty much everything he's brought forward, at least the big issues. She's, um, you know, and he's fought back in ways that he can, you know, he, he obviously thinks there's things that she's doing that are wrong or possibly even illegal. And he's pointed that out with long memos to both her staff and the entire board. So, you know, they've been butting heads since the day she took office. Now, they both uh, emailed your reporter directly to, to expand on, on how they view those relationships. So um, you mentioned that, that Supervisor Miller has said she's standing up for what she said she would do. Um, what does she say about how she thinks she's being treated? Well, she doesn't think she's being treated fairly. And part of that isn't Chuck Huckleberry's fault. Part of that is the fact that she's the minority on the board. You know, minority always seems to lose. There's three Democrats, and then Ray Carroll tends to vote with them more often than not. 
She's you know, more he, of a moderate Republican. More, yeah, more of a moderate was. Republican, and she, you know, she's the Tea Party wing. But you know, Ali's been willing to fight that fight. She's been at the losing end of a lot of four to one votes. You know, it hasn't stopped her from fighting and from pressing on. You know, it's a, it's a, just an interesting dilemma there because she blames Chuck Huckleberry. Chuck works for the will of the entire board. He's worked for Republican boards. He's worked for Democrat boards. You know, he, he's moved back and forth because he works for the board. Those five people are the only people he works for. And whether I like him or you like him or Dylan likes him or Vanessa likes him is irrelevant as long as three of those five people like him enough to keep him. And he's been there a long time, so he's been pretty successful at it. And he also expanded on, on their relationship and said that politics aside, she works differently than the other supervisors he's worked with for the past decades. Tell us about what he said. I think primarily what he's trying to get at is that in the past he's had people on there that disagreed with decisions he's made or disagreed with positions he took on issues, but they were, they were willing to sit down and talk and try to come to some agreement. With Supervisor Miller, there's really none of that. You know, it's either her way or she's not going to listen to you. But that's okay because that's who she ran. That's how she ran. That's who she's, she said she would be. When she runs for re-election, that's exactly who she said she's going to be. You know, her, her obviously goal is to get two more people that agree with her on that board so they can get rid of Chuck and, you know, make things the way that she views it. Okay, so that's the forward-looking part of this. How could this strained relationship and the way that this is working, how could that affect future, uh, the upcoming election in, in November for well, county supervisor seats? There will be other Tea Party type candidates that are running for seats. If they can get Supervisor Miller re-elected and two more, then they will have control of the board and can pretty much do what they want. And one of the first moves would probably be to get a new county administrator. If there's three uh, Republicans. Three Tea Party Republicans. And we have seen candidates running in some of the other, not all the candidates are who are going to get in the race are probably in yet, but we do see challengers running against some of those Democrats and in the open seat that Ray Carroll has That's resigned. That's yeah. There will be enough running. The question will be, can they win? Mm -hmm. All right, Vanessa. I'm turning to you now, and I am personally find it refreshing that we're going to talk about a topic we rarely get to here, which is arts and culture. We spend so much time on policy and politics. Something fun for once. <laughs> yeah, a little different for all of us. Um, the Grammy Awards were last weekend, and that's probably odd for us to be bringing up here, but you reported a Tucson group was actually nominated for one. Tell us about the group. Um, the group was the, the Tucson, sorry, the True Concords Voices and Orchestra. Um, the group was founded in 2004. It was called at that time the Tucson Chamber Artists. They changed their name last year. They say that they're Southern Arizona's only professional orchestra and choir, um, and they've played some pretty prominent shows over the past few years. They played in Centennial Hall for the 10th anniversary of the September 11th attacks and actually made their Lincoln Center debut in Alice Tully Hall last year. Um, and actually, I want to correct you, they got two Grammy nominations. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, and the winner is, what happened when they opened the envelope? So they were nominated. Let me tell you where they were nominated first. They were nominated for Best um, Choral Performance for their album, which they released last year, uh, Far in the Heavens, the music of Stephen Paulus. Uh, they didn't win in that category, but they were one of five nominees around the world. Uh, they were also nominated and actually won in the category of Best Contemporary Classical Composition for the piece Prayers and Remembrances. Um, no one in the orchestra actually composed this piece, but they commissioned it from um, Stephen Paulus. He passed away in 2014, and in his and uh, his wife accepted the the Grammy in his name. Um, she thanked obviously the and recognized the orchestra for for commissioning this piece and for the role they played in it. And then you also reported on the search for a new symphony, symphony director at the Tucson Symphony, which um, you know long people probably know the name George Hansen. He was here for so long. So um, how? how that search is underway or has it been completed? It's been completed. Uh, the search began about three years ago when George Hansen, as you mentioned, uh, announced that the 2014-2015 season would be his last. Um, usually there's about a three-year search process, so this is totally uh, not out of the ordinary. Hansen, uh, of course, was music director for nearly two decades, so there are some pretty big uh, shoes to fill. Okay, we've got just about a minute left. Okay. How does the symphony look for a new director? What's they, the process? Uh, they formed a hiring committee that had a bunch of different stakeholders, members of the symphony, uh, patrons, administration, community members, and invited a bunch of prospective candidates um, to, to play with the orchestra for the past uh, few years. 
So they actually do like a lot of tryouts and interviews. Absolutely, and, and get a lot of feedback from the orchestra, from the patrons as well. And if you want to know who has the job now, yes, we do. <laughs> um, 37 year old Venezuelan born Spanish conductor Jose Luis Gomez, um, when his name was announced um, on Wednesday, uh, the, the room broke into thunderous applause. Everyone seems really excited that he'll be joining us. And uh, he's conducting a performance this weekend. He is, weekend. exactly. Okay. Um, three different performances, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. All right, so there's a chance to see first shot out the door. All right, thanks you all for joining us, and thanks for watching. As always, there's more on our website, including this week, music from the Grammy Award-winning True Concord Voices and Orchestra. I'll see you next week. <laughs>